Jonathan, as a TPD for simulation, I love sharing human factors work um, in paediatrics and bringing it to the clinical environment. I'm not surprised, but it's a really interesting area, isn't it? And it's something really easily you can change. You know, you don't need to buy new gadgets, you don't need extra staff members. It's all about how we interact with each other, and that's really exciting. So actually, with a short training session like in this video and, and other resources, you can make quite a difference, actually, to what goes on. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this video. I'm Marion Gies Cooper. I'm a paediatric intensive care consultant at um, St Mary's Hospital. I'm also the lead for simulation for the London School of Paediatrics simulation programme. As you know, a lot of work on um, human factors has been undertaken in the airline industry and now it's been extended or has been extended probably over the last 15 years or so to high risk organisation and in, in industry and it's become much more embedded in healthcare following high profile cases. The CQC now recommend that we use human factors to develop solutions and reduce the potential of further incidents taking place. We can't eliminate them but, but this will help us as we move forward. When we think about performance, we think about an improved performance, a performance which is standard, or where maybe an, an error has occurred. And, and human factors are those factors that therefore affect somebody's performance. These are some high profile cases that are in the press. Doctors removing the wrong kidney, never events, which I know that everybody hears about regularly, sadly, um, in their workplace. And then, you know, from the airline industry, the contrast is, for example, pilot shuts down the wrong engine, things that you, you know, are never events that you do not want to, to occur. I, I love this sentence, to err is human, to forgive is divine. We do expect errors. We're not gonna completely eliminate them. We know that we work in an industry where there are systems and there are humans and, um, so when these things do happen, we have to have what's called a fair blame culture. As we know, most human errors are induced by system failures. And in the medical profession, we have systems, we have a lot of systems, and we obviously have a lot of people working, and we're looking after patients. So you can Im imagine that you can get to a, sit a situation where an error will take place, despite everything that you, you have tried to do. Cooperation, so how your team works. Leadership, so who's the team leader and how are they running their team and working with the team because it's the everybody in the team responds to a leader. Situational awareness, so that's your own personal situational awareness and the whole team situational awareness. And finally, all these things are involved in decision making. And I think these are this is a really nice way to think about how you use human factors in work and then if you're lucky enough to, to utilise the hidden benefits outside work. Hello, my name is Amutharan Panantha. I'm a consultant in paediatric emergency medicine at Whips Cross Hospital. I'm also a training programme director for the London School of Paediatrics. So today I'd like to talk about patient safety and simulation. When you hear the word patient safety, you may think of errors or things where incidents have gone wrong. Or you may think about reporting tools such as Datexes and serious incidents and how we can learn from them. The WHO have defined patient safety as the prevention of errors and adverse effects to patients associated with healthcare. We know that the aviation industry uses simulation to help with safety and we've already learned from them. We've introduced the pre-operative safety checklist. You may have heard of the crisis resource management which we'll touch on later. In 2000 the Institute of Medicine released a document called To Err is Human. They found that up to 98,000 deaths per year in the States were from preventable medical errors. This was the eighth leading cause of death at the time. Apart from medical clinicians' inexperience, they also stated that most medical errors are systems-based and not individual-based. So it wasn't down to individual negligence or misconduct. So if we try and reduce the errors from the system, we should be able to reduce medical error. The traditional view about patient safety is we'd want as few things as possible to go wrong. Eric Holnagel has called this safety one. They've also introduced this concept of safety two. Why don't we look why as many things as possible go right? So how do we do so well when the conditions are variable? If we look at a clinical scenario, we can think why do things go well? Why do things go not so well? And actually why do we make the decisions that we do? So if I give you an example, the cardiac arrest algorithm, we all know what the cardiac arrest is on paper, but when we put it down into practice, why does it not occur? It's the variables, the good and the bad. 
This is where simulation plays a role. We can look at why things go well and why things go not so well. Different types of simulation. So you may be aware of computer-based simulation such as virtual reality. We do skills training in part task simulation. We're now seeing moulages in life support courses that you may have experienced. There is immersive simulation in the lab with either mannequins or actors and also in situ simulation, which is more realistic. It's in the environment and you're more likely to identify realistic issues. How does simulation help with patient safety? By addressing the good and the bad, we can refer to the crisis resource management list, which helps us identify why things go good and why things go not so good. Now the key question, is there any evidence of a link between simulation and improving patient safety? So there are studies that show that simulation does improve behaviour, knowledge and skills, but there are only a few small studies that show simulation improves clinical outcome, and those are usually with morbidity. So in summary, though there isn't any overarching evidence, it's important we discuss it. And I feel that simulation gives us the opportunity to discuss patient safety, the good, the bad, and why we make the decisions. Thank you for listening to me. Hello, my name is Jane Runnicles. I'm a paediatrician at the Royal Free and a training programme director for the London School of Paediatrics. There's three aspects to situation awareness. Firstly is the perception of elements in our environment. Secondly is understanding their meaning. And thirdly is thinking about the projection for the future. This diagram shows the responsibilities of the individual, the team, and importantly, the concept of shared or distributed situation awareness. Situation awareness is really important in paediatrics. Um, because there are multiple indicators of risk which are important to consider and anyone involved in the care of a child, including their parents and their families, may hold that crucial piece of information. When we're thinking about distributed situation awareness, Brady and colleagues at Cincinnati Children's Hospital proposed this identify, mitigate, escalate model. They proposed a standardised communication whereby they identified patient risk at the bedside communicated this to a ward level safety huddle and if necessary escalated this to senior leaders for a daily safety brief. So by identifying high risk patients in their ward level safety huddle, they were able to discuss this and make a plan to mitigate that risk. We adapted the Cincinnati Hospital model looking at eight different risk factors for patients as listed on this slide. And importantly, all members of the team are present at the huddle for this very short focus on safety. So this may vary from the doctors and nurses involved to wider members of the team. So the play team, the pharmacist, the safeguarding team and the hospital school. Flattening hierarchy, ensuring everybody's voice is heard. We use the model for improvement, which is an excellent QI change methodology model, which can be used to implement any of the tools that improve situation awareness. Because poor situation awareness will result in unrecognised clinical deterioration. And one of these other tools is the paediatric early warning score chart. And it's important to think about escalating and using a structured method of communication, which is again an important concept in situation awareness. As part of the huddles work, some of the teams also implemented druggles, which is a focus on medication safety, ensuring learning is shared amongst the team. So my top tips are around using the model for improvement as a change methodology to improve situation awareness, thinking about tools such as the safety huddle. It's important to engage the wider multidisciplinary team and for that to identify champions from different staff groups, ensuring that you're always adding value to business as usual. By encouraging flattening of hierarchy and focusing on safety, it can improve the safety culture where you work. Thank you. I'm Simon Broughton. I'm a paediatrician from King's and clinical director there. And I really want to tell you about how to maintain patient safety in an emergency. The key point I want to make is that no matter who your role is inside a resuscitation or when you're dealing with an emergency, it's all of your roles to maintain patient safety. So if you're an active follower or if you're a leader and if you notice that something's going wrong, you have a responsibility to deal with that at that point, point it out and make that situation safer. So this tool is called PACE. So the first thing you'll do if you notice that somebody is doing something in the resuscitation which doesn't sit well with you or you disagree with it, you need to firstly do the P of pace which is to ask a probing question. The next thing you'll do after your question if you're still not getting the um, action that you want from the person you're dealing with is to carry out your own assessment and feed that back to this person. 
And then still, if they're still disagreeing with you, you, at that point you need to challenge them. But you still want to do this in a positive, collaborative manner. Otherwise, relationships are going to break down. And finally, you may want to carry out your own evaluation or to escalate above this person so that you maintain patient safety. So an example. So just imagine that you're dealing with a, um, a resuscitation of a bronchiolitic baby and an anaesthetist has come along to um, intubate that baby in the emergency department. And the anaesthetist says that the endotracheal tube is in the trachea. However, the chest is not moving and the oxygen saturations are not improving. You, as the paediatrician, are pretty convinced that the endotracheal tube must be in the esophagus. So your first thing that you may do in that situation is to ask a probing question. Do you think you may have put the endotracheal tube into the esophagus? Now, 99% of the times, that will deal with it. If, however, this person is so dogmatic that they're saying, no, no, I definitely saw the tube go through the cords, the tube's definitely in the right place. At that point, you'll go and carry out your own assessment and you'll feed your findings back and say, actually, you know, I don't think this tube is in the right place. We need to pull this tube back urgently or we're going to be in an arrest situation. Now, if at that point this person is still disagreeing with you, then I think you, at that point you'll be thinking about putting out an arrest call, pulling out the tube yourself and actually taking over the situation. Now, that's a slightly dramatic example of this in real life, but these um, using this tool, PACE, really can help in just about any situation. So I, I really um, suggest that you use PACE whenever you can, especially in an emergency to help to maintain patient safety. And as I said, it is everybody's responsibility. So whether you're a leader, whether you're a follower, use pace, ask probing questions, carrying out your own assessment, then challenge if you're not getting the response you want. And finally, it is your responsibility to escalate and to carry out the emergency that's necessary for that child. Many thanks for listening. This is a key part of patient safety and human factors. Hi, my name's Marilyn McDougall. I'm one of the intensive care consultants at the Evelina Children's Hospital and also for the South Thames Retrieval Service. And I'm here today to talk about the Shell model. Human factors are our relationship with the environment and the equipment where we work. The majority of adverse events that happen in hospital are related to human factors. On a more positive note, Actually, understanding the principles of human factors can improve our patient safety, the efficiency of our working, and actually the pleasure of being at work every day. The S stands for software, which is the guidelines, standard operating principles, and checklists for our daily work. Checklists have become pretty popular in the last year or so, um, and one of the reasons for that is it's a quite a simple tool that can enhance our performance. Moving on, the H stands for hardware. I work in intensive care and that's a pretty hardware heavy environment. Monitors on every patient, infusion pumps stacked up at the bedside, as well as ventilators which children are attached to. I've seen how simplifying our interaction with hardware can improve patient safety. Recently we've introduced standardised concentrations which makes it easier for doctors to prescribe drugs, easier for nurses to administer the drugs and has significantly reduced our incidence of adverse drug effects. The next thing is our environment. Next time you go to a resuscitation, just think about that. Could you move the monitor and make it easier to see the patient and the monitor? Could you move the bed away from the wall a bit and make it easier to get to the patient? Finally, liveware. So that is the people and the teams that we work with. Yes, it's our patient, but it's also how we speak to the people that we work with. Think about how much better it makes you feel if somebody remembers your name. Think about when you go and order a cup of coffee. You use closed loop communication. The person that you order from says, repeats your order back to you. You go to the end of the line and pick up your cup of coffee. But every day at work, you ask for something and often turn around and it doesn't arrive. So ask for it, ask the person to repeat it back to you and ask them to tell you once they've completed that task. Importantly, yourself. The live wire at the center of the shell. How we feel every day definitely impacts on how we work. When you're stressed, you might find you talk really quickly, maybe you look down, mumble. Think about that. Perhaps stepping away from that stressful scenario just for a moment to wash your hands, to pause and reflect, can improve the patient safety. In summary, the Shell model has an S for software, an H for hardware, an E for the environment, an L for liveware, which is the teams that work around us, and an L at the center, which is yourself. 
the person at the center of the shell. So I like to think of it as something fragile, but something that can protect you as well. We've had some great talks from our simulation TPDs on tools they use to improve their clinical practice. Yeah, some of them I'd actually not really come across before, like the shell one. I thought it was particularly neat, actually, the way it brought different things together. And you could really use it in any environment, that kind of model. And I really love taking this to our trainees away from the simulation mm -hmm. programmes, so when we do our teaching programmes in the department, mm -hmm. but also to the undergrads. I think there's a yeah. huge role for that. Yeah. I mean, certainly the undergrads don't really think initially that it's that relevant to them, yeah. but actually certainly as soon as they start seeing how the workplace works with all the different people around and all the different things and tools and patients all interacting in a non-standard way, you begin to see actually you really need to think about these human factors and how you make sure that they're actually working in your favour and actually not making the workplace a bit more dangerous than it should be. So I'm hoping this video will actually give our trainees some tools to use in their day-to-day -day work. Me too. Thank you.